Hello, this is an interview on behalf of the ESCO Conference 2020, and we're very glad to be able to talk to John Van Rien and one of our keynote presenters. So, John, thank you very much for your fascinating talk to the conference. Now, I suppose I'd like to ask you first the question to which I'd most like the answer. Okay. What do you think can be done about Britain's productivity shortfall? And do you think that uh, in practice, the gap with the more advanced European and countries and the United States could be closed in reasonable time? Well, that's the big question, I suppose, that we'd all like to know the answer to. Um, I mean, there's lots of different questions. I suppose the thing which relates most closely to the talk I've just given would be obviously I think that management is an important for understanding some of these uh, these cross-country gaps so one of the things to think about would be how to um, you know raise the quality of management in this in this country and I, I suppose I broadly think about that in two ways uh, this is not just specific to the UK but it's more general to lots of countries you know one could think about um, kind of structural policies uh, the kind of traditional economic policies that we we do to try to change the environment to um, get firms to improve the management or we could think of more direct policies um, to do interventions in terms of um, helping firms especially say small and medium-sized enterprises so in the first group of policies um, what we have uh, certainly found in, in uh, a lot of our work is that you know skills are very important for thinking about improving management so one of the areas uh, where the UK seems to uh, be worsted on is you know as the National Institute as when you were uh, you were there as always emphasized is the kind of role of kind of intermediate skills the kind of uh, the kind of education and the training of uh, of people who have left school and not necessarily going to university so that would be a area i think would be important to to think of in terms of those types of those types of skills um the other area in the uk is that um you know one of the other kind of uh and this is not a, a big necessarily a, a, the largest thing but one of the other areas in the uk that we've seen uh uh, is that we tend to have more family-run firms actually than um, many other uh, of certainly more than the U.S. and actually more than uh, we do in in, uh, in in Germany and France. So we should think a little bit about um, you know either how we uh, help those firms in terms of providing different um, you know training programs, benchmarking information, and also whether we want to you know encourage and at the moment the, in the inheritance uh, tax regime kind of encourages family ownership um so it's not obvious that's necessarily a you know a, a great policy there moving on to the kind of more um the kind of more direct type of thing so i, I think i'm you know the, the the work as a whole suggests that th there could be a role for informational interventions so um helping firms benchmark and offering training programs the reason i'm often reluctant to say this is the solution is that we don't we just don't have great information on the say in the uk on the type of programs which actually are, are, are successful so the government the, the bays and government programs often have lots of you know um business training programs but they're not generally rigorously evaluated so I can, that's the kind of area where I think there's kind of a lot of opportunity potentially to improve management, but whether they actually are going to work, you know, could we replicate what we did in India? I think that's an open question, and that just needs to have more evaluation of those types of those types of policies. So um, there's a, there's a third thing actually as well, which I often don't talk about, which is competition. So competition is clearly one of those things where I think there's a lot of evidence that that's been a, a driver for improved management. Um, I, I've always had the view, I think, that you know, Britain has, you know, relatively strong competition policy, you know, and also you know, has been quite pro-competition, pro-openness to trade. My worry, of course, is that we might be moving in the wrong direction <laughs> in the kind of post-Brexit period if we end up with having, 
you know, greater trade costs if we went to a situation where there was, you know, weakening our competition environment. So that's, that's more of a kind of concern for the, the future. So that's, that's on management. But if you wanted me to ask you the much more general thing, you know, not just about management, what should the UK do and what are the problems of the, the, the UK? I, I'd have to go beyond what I talked about in my talk, which I'm happy to do, but do you want me to do that or do you want me to focus on? Well, well I'd be very talking? grateful if you could. <laughs> okay, so, so then, then looking just much more widely, then, um, you know, I, I, was in, I was involved with this thing called the LSE Growth Commission a few years ago with Tim Besley. Um, and also with, uh, you know, there's been a follow-up to that. So we, we thought a lot about these type of issues in terms of thinking about what the, you know, what could be done. Um, I, you know, I, I think that one of the issues it seemed to me which came out of that and from talking to lots of people was that the UK seems to have not be so good at dealing with doing long run investments. So if we think about um, transport or infrastructure or energy investments, the, it, it seems to be very hard for the, the U, UK to actually make those type of commitments to long run stable investments. And you know, that's just, just a, you know, obviously it's partly a question of money and, and resources. You know, those are often things which get cut very quickly in times of crisis. We saw that happening after, you know, the global financial crisis. A lot of the cutbacks initially came in the form of, uh, of, of kind of um, public investment. But more broadly, it seems to be that, we you know, we don't do those things uh, as well as, as, as we, we, we should do. And, you know, our view, and my view, was that this seems to be partly related to our you know, our kind of very adversarial political culture um, that, you know, we have, you know, we have a, a very fast news cycle, quick rotation of ministers and all the rest of it. We need to think about how we can develop different institutions which are more resilient um, and long-term looking to deal with some of those things. So we, you know, we proposed, and I think that was partly taken up, uh, this kind of National Infrastructure Commission, which I, I think is a, a good organization, although it's had, you know, some issues to try and help with making these long-run decisions. I think um, the kind of um, business uh, bank is also a kind of good idea in the way of trying to create institutions to channel money into longer-run investments. So I, I think there is a, a set of issues around those kind of longer-run type of uh, investments. And the, the final thing on that, would be if we if I thought about the big three long run investments would be around human capital, infrastructure. The third one would be around innovation, research and development. Those types of uh, kind of investments, innovation, I think, are also areas where you know there's, there's kind of room for improvement. Have I got a magic bullet for those? Um, I don't think I I kind of have. Um, I I do think that it's important to. Um, the future prosperity of all countries, including ours, to have, you know, uh, serious investment in research and development and other parts of innovation. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's different ways that could be, I think, that could be enhanced. Could I ask you a bit more, please, about what you've said on infrastructure? Mm. I go to Germany, for instance, you know, I read stories of a bridge, a motorway bridge that's been closed for months because no one can decide whose job it is to repair it. It's on the boundary between two states, uh, in you no know, near Mainz, and uh, no. Also, I mean, the Germans have become worried about the state of their infrastructure. Uh, but do you think that, despite that, they are at a considerable advantage relative to us, or they've put more money into infrastructure in the past, and they're still enjoying the benefits? Yeah, I, so I don't know enough about Germany to, you know, all my, all my, all my <laughs> to give you a, a, a sensible answer to that. And, uh, you know, my, my impression was that Germany traditionally has been, has been better, better on that than, than, than we have. I mean, I certainly from in, in, in the UK, you know, think about the, all the trials and tribulations we've had over the, you know, the, the terminal at Heathrow. 
that that's how long that went on. You know, we still haven't kind of made a decision on that. It, it, it seems, it, it certainly seems to me that, um, I, you know, we do have problems in trying to make those type of long run commitments in transport and, uh, and energy. And those do seem to be related to the kind of uh, very kind of short termist political culture that we have. I mean, it's not to say that those problems are not also true in other countries. Um, but, you know, that would be an area I think where we could we could make some improvements on that. I, I was thinking, I mean, again, it, it, often this, this comes down to the, the, the politics of it. If we wanted to, you know, think about improving housing development in the southeast where we know, you know, we still have um, undersupply. How could we do that? And then we have the issues of maybe this is similar to your issue in Germany, that there is a lot of a local opposition to actually having those uh, developments, often for good reasons, because people don't want to have nice places spoiled. But, you know, if you need to build more houses, you have to think of a way of doing that. And, you know, there, there, sh there should be ways of somehow giving, um, you know, local councils and local authorities more benefits from um, spending the political capital to try and get those developments done. And that may, you know, be part of the whole decentralization agenda that you actually allow some more of those benefits to be kept by um, the kind of local agencies, local politicians. And this may actually give them more of a political will to uh, stand up against some of the nimbyism that uh, that that is that is faced. So that uh, that may be. I mean, maybe there's the same the same problem in Germany. I just don't know the German the German case well enough to talk sensibly yeah. about that. I mean, I suppose that raises the question: you know, how how you actually do that? I remember a colleague of mine saying, or former colleague of mine saying, that if you allowed development on the green belt round Cambridge, you could give a million pounds to each household in Cambridge, and it would still be worthwhile. Now, uh, if those calculations are correct, then, of course, it ought to be possible to clear the gap, but we don't actually have the mechanisms for doing that. The land belongs to the people who own it, not to the local authority, and the local authority can't appropriate it to, you know, to give it to the residents who are objecting to the development. I mean, is, is there a fundamental issue of property rights there? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's going to be harder in some places than it than it than it is in others, and it's going to be too expensive to to you know buy out of people. Um, but I think that I mean, my impression is that it's in some cases it's kind of it's 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 a little bit more ambiguous because you know often the the property is not wholly owned by you know individuals it might be it might be partly owned by you know different groups different developers um so the there may be a room in which you could get um some political will to get you know compromises going in order to to kind of do that i i, I mean often when i was going around when i was doing the lse growth commission talking to people the thing was you know the viewers were why you know, why should we you know we you know we know it would be good to maybe push and get some kind of housing development in this area but it's going to cause us so much political flack and what's the benefit for us all, all we all, all we'll do is get political flack for this and not any any of the benefits so somehow if you could i mean some sometimes i've, I've heard you know you could think of maybe a, having larger political areas so like one of the successes people say of the manchester combined authority is that you could get lots of the different uh groups in one organization and therefore you can do more trade-offs so there's a set of kind of political trade-offs you can do within the larger a larger kind of combined authority than you could if you were a more disaggregated one but that requires a lot of you know consensus and political will to do that which which may sometimes be lacking could i ask you to speculate about how far you think those sorts of issues are likely to be affected by what we've learned from the epidemic i mean we have or many of us have been working from home and have got used to that perhaps in a way that we certainly didn't anticipate. Now, that could reduce pressure on land in the southeast because people can work more remotely, or 
do you think actually it will encourage people to want to move to the outer suburbs and rural areas and increase the problem you're describing? Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, one, one of the phenomena, you know, the, the, the pre-BCE, before COVID epidemic, and for the decades before that, we were kind of witnessing the kind of you know, growth of you know, superstar cities like London. Um, and you see this all over the world, in the US, you know, like San Francisco and Boston. And that seemed to be, you know, just, you know, companies wanted to locate there people wanted to live there despite all the costs and now you know with the pandemic we've seen that you know for for both the you know what you said why do people want to live in places like london which is so horribly expensive well one is that you know you maybe you get these kind of um you know uh better ideas for min mingling with people other, other high human capital people and also people like going out so you go out and see your friends and if the pandemic shifts that equilibrium so that you know we're not really mingling so much face to face we're doing it on zoom like we are now and it's much harder to go out um then um yeah there will, there will be less of a desire i think for people to locate in, in these kind of expensive urban centers and then the question is well where will people live i mean i think that um potentially you can live anywhere right i mean you could uh you could live in a much cheaper place in a much um lower density neighborhood so one scenario is the you know the whole phenomena of very expensive places in london and maybe uh you know other 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 high density cities that price premium goes down and these these this, this will make it easier <laughs> to deal with there won't be such a need to um, have housing developments in these very expensive areas. The, the, I, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think that there will be some of that happens because I think people have learned that working from home is easier and companies have made the investments in technologies like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and everything else to make it easier. But I still think those fundamental forces of agglomeration that there is some benefits to face-to-face -to -face are still important and are difficult to fully replicate on an online platform. So I do think hopefully when a vaccine comes along that the, you know, the, there will still be some, there will still be strong forces to live in in, these, in, these, in, in the center of these superstar cities, although they'll be weaker than they were before. But we don't know. I mean, you know, this, is, this, is, this is very much in the kind of speculative area. Um, I mean, I would say that I have been, you know, <laughs> I, I've been surprised over the last 20 or 30 years how places like London, San Francisco, Boston, New York, how the prices just continue to, to go up for house prices and people want to live in there despite, you know, despite you would think the congestion costs and everything else. So there must be some very strong forces, uh, I guess the, the Marshall alien agglomeration forces, which which were, which were behind that. So I don't think those are completely going to go away, but I, I think they're likely to be weaker than they were you know, before the pandemic. More generally, could I invite you to speculate, please, on what you think the impact of COVID is going to be on productivity? Mm. So perhaps you know, looking at how you think things might settle down in five years' time after we hope we've got a vaccine and have got beyond the no infectious stage of the disease wow that's a great question so i mean obviously i've been focused more on the short term in terms of thinking about this and of course in the short term it's not good <laughs> at all as we know uh you know maybe not as bad as 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 as, as maybe we might have thought the structure was certainly bad and i i guess there's two i mean one question of course is is there going to be how deep will the recession be and will that persist so you know that you know what a, a, a negative scenario is that we don't handle the emergence from the from the pandemic well and you know we end up with you know a, a prolonged recession l-shaped whatever you want to whatever call it that would be bad for productivity um when we get the vaccine and we go beyond this um you know, I, I, it is, there is this, 
in, in relates to what we just said, there is going to be this aspect of where, you know, we're for, we've been kind of forced into a new equilibrium of, you know, using lots of communication technologies like Zoom, as we are now and working with distance that we probably wouldn't have done to the same speed that we, um, we had before. So that, you know, that gives a boost of technological investments which can have um, positive productivity impacts. Um, many of those areas, I suppose, like, you know, the, you know, the UK has strengths in parts of um, developments of those, that type of software. It has strengths in the kind of, you know, as we've seen through vaccine developments and medicine strengths there. So there may be some benefits to the UK for having that. But I think in, in, in general, I think the, um, even when we get the vaccine, I, I think the lingering uncertainty about future pandemics, about future lockdowns, about the fragility. I mean, another aspect of this is the kind of frig the fragility of global supply chains. So I think, unfortunately, that, you know, there's, we're probably going to enter, as we were already doing, a, an, an era of deglobalization, where there are more barriers um, put up to trade, more things are taken away from global supply chains to be locally sourced. And, you know, I actually think that on balance is not going to be a good thing for productivity. I think, you know, having more trade barriers, having more barriers to trade, those are actually going to be negatives. So the communication side might be a positive, like we're doing now and those things. But I think the the, the, my, my, my kind of concern is that there will be a growth of more inward looking um, aspects and more barriers to, to trade, which are, are going to be, um, are going to make the system more fragile. Um, well, thank you very much for those thoughts. Are there any final comments you'd like to make before we wrap up, please? You ask very hard questions, Martin. It makes me think I should, <laughs> I should be thinking about these these in more more depth than uh, than I than I have. I mean, I, I think that I like to end on a, a bit more of, of optimism because I think we are living through very uh, very difficult times. And we thought, you know, the great the great recession, the global financial crisis, was like you know once in a lifetime. But we've seen that this is also uh, what we're having. To go through now is also you know a deeper and a harder shock but I, the way i would think about it is the following is that when we've had you know big crises like this in the, in the past in in in, uh, in the uk and europe and the world war general you know there's, there's two broad responses to it one is the negative response you know i, I was you know my last remarks were the kind of inward lookingness and we retreat back behind walls and barriers and that's a bit like what happened after world war one the other thing is what happened after World War II, and we kind of use this as an opportunity to think about, well, there's you know, a different way of doing business. There's a different way of organizing things. There's a, there's a, there's a, a new set of possibilities of, um, of tackling some of the longer run problems that we've had. And I kind of hope the second is the one what we do, that this kind of the pandemic shock can actually make us realize that, you know, perhaps the direction of travel that we were going in prior to the pandemic, the kind of you know, the trade walls, the increasing um, inward lookingness, that's not the way to go. And we should take what we learned off the Second World War, which is that we need to have, you know, an international rules-based system. We need to have more global cooperation. We need to make investments in research, development, and technology to really um, bring us as a, as a society and economy into a, into a better world. So, you know, I, I, I hope we go for the second and not the first. <laughs> and we take the lessons from the Second World War from the pandemic rather than the First World War. Well, thank you very much on that you no know, optimistic note, or at least identifying an optimistic route. You no, know, perhaps we should wind up, but uh, it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation on top of the really interesting lecture that you kindly gave. Well, thank you, thank you, Martin, for taking the time to both chair the lecture and also to uh, uh, cross-examine me with, with the questions. <laughs> I mean, enjoyed both very much. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of you to say that. Many thanks. Bye.